Welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. This video is airspace requirements. These are the things you have to have or do in order to be allowed to operate in each one of these airspaces. We'll start off easy with class Echo and Golf and work our way up through all the requirements. In order for you to fly in class Golf and Echo airspace, there really is no requirement. You don't have to have a certain certificate and your airplane doesn't have to have any sort of equipment per se. In other words, if you're a student pilot, you can fly in class Golf and Echo airspace. Or maybe you're flying a weight shift control aircraft and you don't even have a pilot certificate whatsoever. You can do that in class Golf and Echo airspaces. Class Delta, on the other hand, does have a few requirements. For one thing, you must be at least a student pilot in order to operate in class Delta airspace. You also have to establish two-way radio communication with air traffic control in order for you to enter class Delta airspace. Two-way radio communications are established when air traffic control repeats your call sign back, and that's called establishing communication. If you call them and you say tower November 12345 inbound for landing, and they respond with aircraft calling standby, you haven't established radio communication. Now if they do say November 12345 standby, that technically is two-way radio communication, so you can proceed into class delta airspace. Sometimes they will specifically say November 12345 remain clear of class delta airspace, in which case you obviously can't enter. All that to say that two-way radio communication is established when air traffic control repeats your call sign back. Class Charlie airspace is very similar to class delta airspace. You have to establish two-way radio communication and you also have to be a student pilot. One additional requirement in class Charlie airspace is that you have a mode C transponder and mode C simply means that your transponder will report altitude as well as position. Class Bravo, if you remember, is some of the busiest and the most congested airspace in the United States. So for Class Bravo airspace, you have to establish and maintain two-way radio communication the entire time. You also need to have a clearance specifically saying cleared into whatever airspace. So they have to clear you into Class Bravo airspace. It'll sound something like November 12345 cleared into Miami Class Bravo airspace and that's a clearance in order for you to be able to operate in Class Bravo airspace. Not only that, but you have to have a private pilot certificate at a minimum, or you could have a student pilot certificate, but you have to have an endorsement from your flight instructor in order for you to operate in Class Bravo airspace. Keep in mind that there is a list of Class Bravo airspaces where student pilots are not allowed to fly solo, and that list is in Part 91, Subsection D. Personally, I would avoid Class Bravo unless you're at least a private pilot, maybe you have somebody go with you. It's very busy, congested, and confusing. You also need a Mode C transponder in Class Bravo airspace. Remember that Mode C veil that we talked about, the 30 mile ring around Class Bravo airspace? Inside of that 30 mile ring, you have to have a Mode C transponder. There are a couple things that I didn't talk about in our airspace discussion, and so I'll throw it in here. There are a couple ways in order for you to operate VFR in Class Bravo airspace and kind of stay away from Class Bravo airspace. One of those is a VFR flyway. The FAA publishes this flyway chart and it shows areas where you can stay in order for you to avoid all the major traffic flows in and out of the primary Class Bravo airspace. You do have to have a clearance in order for you to operate there, but at least it will keep you away from most of the traffic there are also VFR corridors. Now these aren't as popular. There's probably just a couple around the country and they allow you to fly through Class Bravo airspace without getting a clearance. And they do have special requirements and uh, here's one from LAX for example. The FAA did establish transition routes and those are a lot more popular. They're the double-sided arrows that you'll see on the chart. They allow you to fly through Class Bravo airspace as well, but you do need a clearance for them and you do have to communicate with air traffic control. And here's LA once again with all the preferred routes right there. If you're planning to fly in Class Bravo airspace, I would highly encourage you to study these things until your eyes pop out basically, because you do need to know all this stuff in the specific Class Bravo airspace you're in. It's very congested, very busy, and air traffic control is busy as well. And so you do want to make sure that you at least know what's going on or what to expect before you get there. 
Our last airspace is Class Alpha airspace. And in order for you to be in Class A airspace, you have to fly under IFR flight rules, which you already knew from the previous videos. IFR means that you are instrument rated and qualified, and you can do that with a private pilot with an instrument rating or a commercial with an instrument rating. In other words, you have to have an instrument rating. Your airplane also has to be IFR equipped and certified. And on top of that, you have to have an IFR clearance in order for you to enter Class Alpha airspace. You do have to maintain two-way radio communication, and you need a Mode C transponder anytime you're in Class Alpha. This last thing I might have mentioned in another video, but anytime you're in Class Alpha airspace, your altimeter setting is 2992. That's the standard altimeter above flight level 180. Now there are a couple things I did want to mention that don't really go well with anything else and those are speed limits and transponder requirements just to kind of sum everything up for you. Below 10,000 feet the maximum speed you can go is 250 knots. If you're under class Bravo airspace or in a VFR corridor your maximum airspeed is 200 knots. Also if you're within 4 nautical miles of a class Charlie or Delta airspace below 2500 feet AGL your airspeed is also 200 knots. So there's three main airspace limitations. Now I know what you're thinking. I'm flying this 172 that could maybe make 170 knots on a good day diving down with full power. Why do I need to know these speed limits? That's a really good question and a really valid point. And until you start flying bigger airplanes it really doesn't make much sense. When I take off from a class Delta airspace, for example, we take off, we accelerate to 200 until 2500 feet AGL, then we accelerate to 250 until 10,000 feet, and then we climb at about 290, 300, 310, something like that, until we get to cruise and we speed up even more. Until you get to a jet, those limitations don't really apply as much, but you should know them regardless. Some of the airspaces I mentioned required a transponder and it's somewhat difficult to keep track of all of them, so here's a little summary that should help you out. This of course is Mode C transponder that we're talking about. You need a Mode C transponder anytime above 10,000 feet. You also need a Mode C transponder within a 30 nautical mile veil around Class Bravo airspace. And you also need a Mode C transponder anytime you're in or above Class Bravo and Charlie airspaces. Now, what if you don't have a transponder, or what if yours broke, or they took it out for maintenance? Can you still fly in those airspaces? And the answer, surprisingly, is yes. As long as you ask air traffic control for permission. You just call them up and say, hey, I don't have a transponder, can I still come in? And usually they'll be alright with it if there's not too much traffic. Periodically they'll ask your altitude and your position in order to separate other traffic from you, or for you to get traffic advisories of other airplanes in the area. Maybe now you can see why I split airspace up into so many different videos. It's because if all of this was to come together in video one, first of all it would probably be about a half hour long, and secondly your brain would explode. So hopefully this stuff makes sense. Of course as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below. And I did start making quizzes for all these videos, so if you click the link in the description below you might be able to answer a couple questions to see if you learned anything from the video. And until next time, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.